Chris, welcome to New Orleans in our School of Cooking. I am How delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. We're going to do some gumbo today, and we're going to do some bananas foster. Ooh. But I need you to get you in the right uniform here. So oh, I'm very good. Very good. Here. Ooh. You want to put that on? Side oh, behind. Oh, oh. So I will feel like an official chef. Now, I've got to warn you, I'm not a cook. I don't know much about this. I'm trusting I'm in good hands. Yeah. You know, here's how this works. All right. I'm going to coach you through this. If you loved what you cooked, well, that's due to superior coaching, right? <laughs> on the other hand, if you don't like it, well, you did it. My it's fault. on you, right? My so fault. it's win-win it's for me, all right? Okay, so let's wash up to all start, right, all right? Good. Always a good idea to have some hygiene. We have some soap here. Got a towel for you. Let me tell you about our setup here. What we're gonna do today is cook on some induction stoves. They're really, really special because they're twice as fast as regular electric stoves. They're faster than gas, nice and even, and we chefs love them. And the way this works is there's a big electromagnet under there, and what happens is that electromagnet excites all the ferrous molecules in the bottoms of these pots and pans. They get vibrating, and they cause heat. That friction causes heat, and that's how we heat these pots, all right? If the stove gets hot, it's just from the pan's heat coming back onto that glass. But they're really special. It's something you learn about when you take science in school, all right? Well, that's one thing about cooking. Here we, we got some physics. There's a lot of chemistry to this. That's right. So there's a lot of science to cooking. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, it's kind of loose science because you don't have to be really precise. Now, if we're baking today, everything has to be just exact. But today we're doing stovetop cooking, and so we can play. Most of our ingredients are measured out in the interest of time, but we can play with those however we want. So that right? gets to the art of cooking. That's right. And I'm in the hands of an artist. Yeah, I don't know about that. So, okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, some culinary terms. So we all start at the same level, and then we'll uh, talk about the people that brought all this to New Orleans over time. And then we're going to get you busy cooking, okay. all right? So when we're cooking, four things make up flavor, not, not just uh, what we taste. First is what we see with our eyes. Second is what we smell with our nose. The aroma comes up our nose, and the back aroma that comes through our mouth up the backside. And third is texture. And finally is taste. You change any one of those four things, you've changed the flavor dynamics of that dish. So when we see something or smell something that's good to eat, our salivary glands and digestive juices automatically start to operate. And we usually we don't even know that's happening. And it's in our DNA, back to caveman days, we couldn't hang out like this and have a good meal together because something bigger than us would probably have us for lunch, yeah, right. right? So those get going. And when that happens, it extracts oxygen out of your blood away from these larger muscle masses and you tend to relax. That's the beginnings of, of comfort foods. And that's why those companies spend all that money on those big full color glossy ads on television or at night on the nice oranges and reds and steam coming up. It's because you see that and you want some of that. Now, when uh, you, you, you get a little older, you know, someday we may be taking our meals through a straw, but right now I got chompers. I want to feel a texture on my palate, right? And, and when you go to someone's house and they serve you leftovers, and there's nothing wrong with that, but when they do that, somehow you know, the back of your brain senses that this is not the first time that's been on the table. And the way that you know that is because the natural texture is long gone, all right? And so um, when, when you serve people leftovers, what you want to do is just before you serve them, you throw some fresh bit of texture, maybe some more vegetables, or today we're making a chicken on dewy gumbo, maybe tomorrow we put in some oysters or some mud bugs, crawfish, all right? That idea of layering is something that is un very unique to New Orleans and probably sets our cooking aside in South Louisiana from just about anywhere else in the world because we didn't have a lot of ingredients to pick from. We had to find a way to take the same ingredients and get multiple results, all right? If I lived where you lived and I wanted to change the texture, I just add a different ingredient. I want to change the taste, different ingredient. Here we couldn't do that. So we're going to do some layering today and show you how to do that. All right. But flavor is very important. What you see, what you smell, the texture, and finally the taste. Let's talk a little about who the people were that brought all this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this was really swampy areas. Uh, we call it bayou. Sounds fancy, but let's face it. It's water up to here 24-7, right? Our feet are wet all the time. We've been blessed with so many wonderful things. We probably have the best fishing in the world between the Gulf, the bayous, the lakes, the streams, the rivers. Wonderful fishing for finned fish and shellfish alike. Great. Uh, we are a gross export of that. Up in the Chesapeake Bay, you're not too far from there, I, I hear, but, but you know, another world-famous fishery. But you know, over the last 25 years or so, 
uh, uh, almost a third of the, the blue crabs being sold out of Maryland and, and that Virginia area are being fished out of Louisiana waters. We ship them up there, you put a Maryland stamp on them, you sell them to the tourists. Nothing wrong with the Chesapeake, the point is we are blessed as a great uh, fishery here. We're also blessed with wonderful hunting. On our license plates, when people come here, they notice this old slogan that says, Sportsman's Paradise. That's not about football and baseball. Sorry. That is about hunting and fishing. It's been a part of our culture for thousands of years with the indigenous people and for the last 300 years with our Africans and European peoples. Hunting's still a big part of our culture. But what we're not blessed with is dry feet. And so you will not see any uh, uh, waving fields of wheat, oats, rye, corn. It's just too wet. We could grow three things. Indigo for making blue and purple dye. We don't do a lot of that anymore. Rice. We've been one of the largest producers of rice in North America for more than 300 years. And sugarcane. By far, we've been the largest producer of sugarcane in North America. In fact, it's in large part why old Louis XIV, that great sun king of France, wanted Louisiana. Okay? The... The Spanish come through and Hernando de Soto's boys come through here in the 1540s. They're looking for gold and silver like they found in Mexico. All they found here is mosquitoes and alligators, so they pass. And so 100 years later, King Louis XIV sends René Robert Cavalier de La Salle. He comes down here from where my ancestors were up in, uh, in Canada, in the St. Lawrence River off of Quebec. They come down here and they look around. They say, the boss is going to love this because he can grow sugar cane here. He had colonies all over the world. His most profitable colony was an island in the Caribbean by the name of San Domingue because they were growing sugar cane there. He made a lot of money off that, and this was perfect for that. So that's how we get started. The French arrive with Africans from the Senegambi region of West Africa. The French have this idea of smooth sauces, lots of spices, slower cooking methods. And it is a fact of our culinary history, the, the French were never happy with the food they had here because they didn't have those ingredients. The boss drops them off here and says, see you later, good luck, all right? They don't bring back food or all these things because the colony's not supposed to cost them money. It's supposed to make money for the king. And so if they couldn't hunt fish or gather it, they just didn't eat it. If it wasn't for the, the natives that were here that showed the Europeans and the Africans how to hunt fish and gather and what water to drink, which water they couldn't drink, they would have had some real tough sled. So the French contribute the idea of all these sauce and stuff, but don't do a lot about that. On the other hand, the natives show us how to take the, 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 the sassafras roots and make a crude root beer. They show us how to take the young, tender leaves of the sassafras and dry those and grind those, and that makes something called filet, which was initially a medicinal. If you had a, a skin irritation, a bug bite, a burn, a rash, they'd make a salve by adding a little moisture, scare that, put that on your skin, and that would help protect and heal that. If you uh, had an upset stomach, they'd make a tea out of that filet and drink it to settle your stomach and intestines. But they also found it was a natural thickener. So remember I said we, we can't grow wheat down here. And until we could buy wheat to make our flour, to make our breads and roux, uh, filet was one of those things we used to thicken our gumbos in those days, okay? The, um, the, the, the Africans arrived in the Senegambia region of West Africa as enslaved people. And, and the Senegambia region is where that Senegal River and Gambia River just about come together and spill out in the eastern Atlantic. That valley between those two river basins is one of the richest agricultural valleys on earth. That's where rice comes from. That's where sugar cane comes from. Our Louisiana yam or sweet potato comes from there. Many, many other things, including something called kingumbo. Now, kingumbo is how we get the name of our pot that we're going to make today. All right, Kingumbo was their term for okra. It also was a natural thickener. So we had a choice between filet or okra to thicken our soup, stews, and sauces. All right. Following them, our Germans arrive in 1721 because they were starving here. They needed some help. And so King Louis takes about 100 German families from the Alsace region, puts them on French ships, and brings them here as our first farmers. They bring cattle, dairy products, sausage-making skills, brewing skills, baking skills, all, all those sausages that we make here with those fancy French names, those are all German sausage engineering. All the breads for 300 years, it's been our German bakers baking Italian loaves in the French Quarter here, all right? So they add a lot. They couldn't stay right here in New Orleans because this was already built out as a little fort. So we put them further up the river to a place we still call Des Alamans or the German coast because the land's drier there and they could farm that, okay? And then fast forward to 1762, and after the Seven Years' War, when the, the English whip the, the, the French, 
And at that time, uh, Spain takes over. And when Spain takes over for the next 41 years, they bring the spices. It was not the French. The Spanish brought the spice. The Spanish brought the heat, the hot peppers and such that we're famous for. The Spanish bring the tomatoes in what's called the Colombian trade from old Mexico. And the Spanish bring the pigs and share those with the Acadians, the Cajun folks, all right? Uh, and now we're really cooking between what the natives showed us, the Africans, the French ideas of cooking, uh, the, the, the Germans and the, and the Spanish. Now we weren't going to go hungry anymore. We've had lots of natural disasters here down here, but we've never go, gone hungry or thirsty ever since all these people arrived. All right. So that's a little background on how we get started. By the year 1800, we had um, about 36 different nationalities here. By 1900, hundreds of nationalities. And everybody that's ever come here has added a method or an ingredient to our gumbo pots. It continues to evolve, okay? I'm excited to see what we're gonna add to this because that sounds like a wonderful recipe for success. It is, and that's why this is one of my favorite things to cook because as we cook this, I think of all those people that came here over time, that whole history of that culture and the ingredients they brought. But not, to, so, not to get too heavy for a second, but that sounds like an awful lot in this pot. I mean, the hundreds of years of tradition and heritage that's right. going into what we're about to make. That's right. It's all going to be in there. It's going to look like a little bit of protein and vegetables, but it's going to be a lot of heart that goes in, just <laughs> overflowing in there, all right? And you're going to make it. Are Woo! you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So what's the difference between Creole and Cajun cooking? Great question. The cooking itself uh, is, it, the differences are our Cajun cooking is usually our country cooking, okay? Uh, a lot of game, if, if what you're eating has game in it or heavier cuts of meat stuff, more likely from our Cajun side of the family. Um, not as many spices and such, because out there in the bayou, they didn't, they didn't have a lot of spices and stuff to work. We had some salt from old Avery Island, which is a salt dome that comes up from the earth. We had a little bit of pepper and stuff, but, but not a lot of overspicing. A lot of people when I travel think that if it's Cajun, it's anything with Tabasco sauce on it. You know, a hamburger, oh, it's a Cajun burger now, you know? But, but it, the, it's usually one pot meals uh, with, a lot, with game and other things in there. Creole cooking is usually our city cooking. Smoother sauces, longer cooking methods, more spices, more gentle stuff. Typically the Creole cooking was in the cities. Cajun cooking was in the countries, especially west, southwest of here where, where the Acadians still live. Now the people themselves, the, the, the Creoles, Creole comes from the Portuguese Creole, which simply was their way of telling the difference between a Portuguese person born in the motherland of Portugal versus a Portuguese blooded person born in one of their many colonies around the world. So the English use that term, the Dutch use that term, the French and Spanish, everybody uses that Portuguese term as Creole. And so, for instance, if, if you and I were, were born and raised in Spain, and when we turned 30, said, let's go take on that Louisiana adventure, and we came here, maybe we live here another 80 years, but throughout our whole life, when we're walking out on that banquette, the sidewalk, they'd say, oh, are those are those uh, Spanish guys. But our children that were born here, uh, they would be Creos. And so anybody that arrived here before this becomes an American territory, goes from a European colony to American territory on December 20th of 1803, right over there in the square, all right, where they signed those transfer documents for the Louisiana Purchase. When that happens, uh, anybody that was born here before that date is a Creo. So we had French Creos, Spanish Creos, African Creos, Deutsches Creos, the Germans, etc. Now, we have professors that will tell you if you weren't born before that date, you can't be a Creole. But all of us locals dispute that. We say if you can trace your ancestors to those people, you certainly are a Creole. And their cooking, again, is usually the city cooking. <clears throat> the Cajuns, which was uh, part of my ancestors, they left France in the mid-1600s. My particular ones settled on the St. Lawrence River in about 1640 or so. And uh, after the, the Seven Years' War, uh, or French-Indian War as we called it, uh, the English take over Canada and they say, look, you guys can stay. We need settlers, but a couple conditions. One is you have to swear allegiance to King George III. They talked about that and they said, we can do that. We can do that. You know, France hasn't done a lot for us in the last 150 years. Second condition is you have to forget about this Catholicism stuff, become a member of the Church of England. 
that was kind of a, a, a no-go because the church was life itself to them. So what happens is a lot of these Acadians, they settled in uh, what they called Acadiana, which the English changed to New Scotland or Nova Scotia after this war. And they settled again in, uh, in the Quebec area. So these people get rounded up, they get distributed all up and down the east coast of North and South America. Some sold into white bondage or slavery as far south as the Falkland Islands. Over time, a bunch of them make it back to France. And France rounds them and says, we love you like brothers and sisters, but you left here 150 years ago. We don't have any free land for you. But we have this wonderful place of milk and honey called Louisiana. We'd like you to help us settle. And King Louis hired a Scotsman by the name of John Law. And he says, this isn't working out so well. I need you to put your brains to this and help me sell this. So he came up with a, a promotional plan like sometimes you hear about today. He made these posters, which you'll find in our history museum, about this big. And on the poster, it has a sketch of a, of a Frenchman with a, what looks like a corn cob pipe and a hat sitting in a rocking chair on a porch of a little house. And in the distance, there's an indigenous man with a feather in his hat, and, and it says, with a hoe in his hand. And in French, it says, the Indian loves the Frenchman so well, he does all your work for you. So with that kind of recruiting back in 1762, they bring a whole bunch of these Acadians this way. And this fort was already built out, occupied, they put them west southwest here and, and uh, out in the bayou. And the natives were the ones that helped them survive. Without the help of the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Natchez, the Homus, and all these others, they would have had a tough time. So, so with that, uh, they, they helped them survive. They can't pronounce Acadian too well. Pretty soon it becomes Cajun. Cajun is a slang for those Acadian people that went from France a few hundred years ago to Canada and then down here. And their cooking is our country cooking. You remember we said that you cannot uh, grow a lot of things down here. And even today, the motto of our Cajun families is, if you can catch it, we can cook it. And we mean it. We can make a lot of things really tasty. <laughs> Excellent question. Thanks. So is it time for us to get cooking? Let's do that, all right? So what we're going to cook today is the most popular gumbo in South Louisiana. There's lots and lots of gumbos. Every family has their own recipe. Every restaurant has their own recipe. But what we're going to make is the most popular. If you go to one of our uh, state uh, or local festivals like Jazz Fest or French Quarter Fest, and all the cardboard sign says is gumbo, it's going to be this gumbo. All right? And it's the most popular because it's what we locals like the most. It's called a chicken and andouille gumbo. So we're going to start with some, some nice chicken here. Okay. And over here, we have some andouille sausage. Now, when you make a, a smoked sausage, you typically will start with a nice ham and you grind the meat, you spice it, you put it in a sausage casing and you smoke it. And that's wonderful. But when you make andouille sausage, you start with a nice ham and you first smoke that ham. And you never ever grind the meat when you're making andouille. You chop it and then you spice it, put it in the sausage casings, and you smoke it again. So it's a more expensive twice smoked sausage. Very, very nice. It's in our, our gumbos and a lot of other dishes as well. And then here we have our vegetables. In Europe, you have something called uh, a mirepoix. Now, a mirepoix is always half onion, one-fourth celery, and one-fourth carrots. But we cannot grow a deep root crop like a carrot. It would rot in the soil here. So we grow a green pepper, a bell pepper that grows wonderful. And so it's no longer called a mirepoix, it's called the Trinity. Catholicism dominates our culture for the last 300 years. All the terms of the church pervasive throughout our, our culture, including our cooking. And so the Trinity is the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It's always half onion, one-fourth celery, one-fourth green pepper goes into everything. And then this, my friend, is the Pope. The Pope is garlic. You know, the Pope's hat looks like a clove of garlic, maybe. And when we put the Pope with the Trinity, we call it the Holy Trinity. Okay. And I know everybody always snickers at that, but you go to any of our grocery stores, even the small ones, you're going to find Trinity in one to five pound bags already cut and mixed to that ratio. And they'll say Trinity. That's how much we use. Uh, you used to go to any of our restaurants and sit near the kitchen where you can hear what's going on, which is I recommend. That's the noisiest place to sit, but you'll learn a lot there, right? You're not going to hear us say, hey, please go in the back and, and get this much onion. And, and while you're there, measure out this much celery. And oh, I almost forgot, measure out this much green pepper. We're going to call for Trinity, Pope, Holy Trinity. Everybody in our industry knows what that means, all right? It's just a little shorthand like any profession would have. And then green onion, scallions, sometimes parsley, that is our blessing, right? Omni Domni Vortac. The blessing the blessing goes on last. Remember we talked about those four things that make up flavor. 
what you see and the texture and the aroma. If we put those green onions in the pot and boil them away, we'd ruin them, right? They wouldn't look like green onions anymore. They look like grass we mowed in the backyard last week. They wouldn't have a pleasing texture. They'd be all mushy, right? And also, uh, they wouldn't taste like green onion because they're going to give their delicate flavor up to the pot, reabsorb the flavor around them, and our bulb onion in the trinity will dominate that. So you'll, you've just wasted them. So we're always going to add the, the blessing last as a garnish. So now it looks good for presentation. It's have a nice texture. It's going to have a nice mild release of individual flavor. And that's why, again, you sit at a chef's table. You sit near the kitchen. If you hear say, hey, it's time for the blessing, don't look through the glass and think we're doing this. That's our way of saying it's time to get the garnish on, get these out to the dining area, all right? Uh, we have some flour here and some fat, and we're going to make a roux. Now, before we had wheat, remember we talked about we could use either the okra, which was kin gumbo, or we could use filet powder as a thickener. But once we start affording wheat in the early 1800s, we start making roux, a flour roux. Now, roux sounds fancy, R-O-U-X. It's just the beginnings of a gravy. I'm sure you've made one at some time, and they're made all over the world under different names. But we have to make a roux for three reasons. If we take this flour and we just put it right in the pot, it's going to be pasty old flour in the pot because flour has an enzyme in it that prevents it from thickening. So by heating the flour up in that hot oil, it's going to neutralize that enzyme. Now the flour can be a thickener. When you're taking those turkeys during the holidays and you want to make gravy out of those drippings, most people are going to use cornstarch because it doesn't have that, that property. You could use flour, you just have to heat it hotter and longer. Okay. Second reason, the longer we cook that flour with that hot heat, the smokier and nuttier the roux becomes. And finally, um, the darker it's going to become. So let's, let's get going here. We're going to, let's turn some, some heat on here. I'm going to move this out of the way just for a bit. And we're going to put some heat up on here. And we're going almost up to high, but not all the way to high. Right, okay. right. This would be like atomic high on most home stoves. Okay. okay, this is really cooking. And you can select yourself a whisk out of there. Maybe the flat whisk is a good start. And then take your flour and just put it right in there. Okay. Now, by tradition, in South Louisiana, we're going to use one of two types of fat, all right? Either butter for making our lighter roux, or we can use um, lard, and that's what we're using today. Ooh, it's that, wonderful stuff. That okay? seems like good old-fashioned. That is. Right, do I it's start the best. Do I start? Go ahead and start stirring it up. So, Chris, just get it all dissolved in there. As soon as all that flour is dissolved in that hot fat, you have a roux. That's a blonde roux. A blonde roux would be used if we're making a cream soup, where we have half stock, half heavy cream, and that blonde roux. Because all we want out of that blonde roux is thickening ability. We don't want to change the color of the cream, and we don't want to add the smoky, nutty aroma. Now, what's the difference between using this uh, flat whisk and just a spoon? Why am I, I like the flat whisk because you get all those little tines of the whisk down in there. It helps dissolve things quickly, especially in a small pan. Mm -hmm. It's harder to get a bigger spoon or a larger whisk. And, and when you're using the traditional round whisk, uh, you're just getting those bottom uh, tines in there. The other ones are just uh, okay. something to look at, right? So with a, with a little bit of, of stuff in that pan, the flat whisk works well. Now I've already spilled flour. Uh, I'm a sloppy cook already. I, That's I, all right. I'm messing up your kitchen. That's now. okay. That's good. So the, uh, the formula for a roux is very simple. It's, yeah, don't worry about that. It's not okay, gonna bounce just leave it in like that? Yeah. Okay. So the formula for a roux is, is uh, half fat, half flour. So a cup, a cup of fat, a cup of flour make one cup of roux. And one cup of roux will thicken eight to 10 cups, whatever you're trying to thicken. That's, that's your guide, okay? We have, uh, we wanna keep stirring. I tell you, let's go, to a, let's go to a roux spoon now. I'll take the whisk from you. All right. You won't need that. And now the trick with that roux spoon is you want to keep all that roux moving. You want to clear every bit of that pan around the edges and in the center. Beautiful. Good job, Chris. Just keep all So that's that why way. this uh, particular spatula is curved the way it is, to help with the... That's, that's right. It's, it's, you know, if we were using a traditional spoon, uh, you would only clear a little bit at a time. And what's happening, you'd scrape it this way and that way. And when you go to wash your, your pots and pans, it would look like a checkerboard pattern on the bottom, okay. right? Yeah. That's where that roux would build up, leading to scorching and burning. So you want a wooden spatula or a roux spoon, something that's nice and wide, that's gonna allow you to clear the entire bottom, okay? And, uh, and, and that curve just makes it a little more relaxing for you to use, okay? 
So the longer I keep this on, the darker and thicker it gets. Correct. Right. Correct. The, the, um, we have three primary sauces in South Louisiana, a Meunier sauce, a Creole sauce, and an etouffee, and they all start with a roux. So, so the, the, the Meunier sauce is our blonde sauce. The Creole sauce is our red sauce. And, and the etouffee, which means to smother, it's a sauce designed to smother rice or smother a nice piece of meat or get put in a pocketed or butterflied piece of fish. That's our brown sauce. And so the, when all that flour was first dissolved, you, you, you made a roux, Chris, and that roux would be used for our cream soups. Now this is a dirty blonde color. This is already too dark to put in that soup. This is what we'd use for that Meunier sauce. We want a very, very slight smoky, nutty aroma and taste. As it gets to be the color of peanut butter, and of course that depends on what kind of peanut butter you like, but when it gets to be the color of peanut butter, that's gonna have a nice, gentle, smoky, nutty aroma and taste. And that roux we're gonna put in our Creo sauce, which is made with tomatoes and sweet Spanish paprika. Because we don't want a roux that's so dark that it's gonna blunt the bright red color of the tomatoes and turn it brown. So that's, we'd stop there. Then we keep going with that roux and it's gonna get brown. That's gonna go into our etouffee to make our, our brown sauce. And then today we're gonna to keep on going from there to a beautiful, dark, um, exotic, brown gumbo roux, all right? That gumbo roux is what gives the gumbo that nice, smoky, nutty aroma and, and, and taste. It's what gives it the color, all right? And it's thickening. I can see as, as my spoon passes through the roux, I get a little glimpse of the bottom of the pan, and I can see how this would quickly cook to the bottom of the pan if I wasn't agitating it all the way. That's right. That's right, you're doing great. You gotta keep it moving. Roux is a very powerful flavoring agent. If you burn just a little bit of roux, you, you've, you can't just spoon that out and keep going because it's gonna disflavor the whole pan with a very bitter, very distinct bitter aftertaste. So you burn a little bit of the roux, you've gotta throw it away and start over. And that's, yeah. So you've, you've gotta have your mise en place, your, your, everything in its place. It's a good idea anytime you're cooking anything. So you don't want to stop, turn off the stoves, the ovens to run to the grocery store for something you forgot. So always have all your stuff out before you first turn on any of the, any of your, the, the stoves. And, and with the roux, that means you have to have your, your phone here and your music here and your drinks because you're not going anywhere uh, for the next half hour or so, all right? Our children grow up in South Louisiana knowing when they smell a roux cooking, they have a half hour to do whatever they want. That's when they're <laughs> bouncing on the beds and goofing off. If the doorbell rings, ignore it, all right? If it's important, they'll come back. I mean, that's their problem. Because even if you take this off the heat, that's so hot in there, it's gonna burn by the time you get back and you have to start over. Now, I see it thickening in there. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. You're a natural at this. I've got a good teacher. Yeah. Well, that's, again, too dark for the soup. It's now too dark for the Meunier sauce. You're just about reaching that peanut butter color, which is what we'd use to make that Creole sauce. You've heard of shrimp Creole and sausage Creole. And that's how we make that, mm. okay? Now I, this, I, it's, it's given off a really nice aroma too. That it's, nice, yeah. you're starting to sense that smoky, yeah. nutty aroma. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, wonderful stuff. Now this is the traditional way to make roux, but it's not the only way. If you want, you can melt down the fat, stir in the flour, put it in the microwave. Melt down the fat in a Dutch oven, stir in the flour, put the lid on it, put that Dutch oven in your traditional oven at about 375 degrees. Don't touch it in about 45 minutes. You'll have what we call a brick roux because it'll be brownish red like, like a brick, okay? Um, if you want, you can go down to aisle nine in the grocery store and buy roux in a bottle. They'll have, they'll have the blonde roux, a peanut butter roux, and a dark roux right next to each other on the shelves, okay? It's kind of neat, um, you know, as we stand here talking, it's darkening and darkening, and you don't actually see it darkening. But I look at you for a minute, and then I look back and look, ooh, I can notice it's getting darker. Yeah, but yeah. It's a slow, gradual it is. process here. Yep, and now's that point where if you had to leave this for a few seconds uh, until now, you could get away with it. But now, if you stop stirring that for a little while, it's going to burn. I'm gonna just step our heat down just a little bit to what would be a medium high on most of our home stoves, okay? So we just keep it moving. All those edges, keep all that moving. Now, if you look in a, uh, if you, if you look in a, uh, in a cookbook, how to make a roux, you'll find that there's, um, they tell you use low heat and it's to make a gumbo roux like making, it's gonna take you an hour and a half. Oh. We don't have that kind of time, right? <laughs> so, so three tricks. I use a thick bottom pan and if you have a cast iron pan at home, that's perfect. Nothing's ever been made better. But a thick bottom pan, not an expensive pan, but 
You want a pan so that like if you pull the roux spoon slowly through the middle, you'll see you kind of expose the bottom of the pan a little mm -hmm. bit. If this was a thin pan, a thin aluminum pan, when you do that, that dry portion of the pan would get hotter than the, the pan around it. And when the roux closes back over, it tends to scorch it and burn it. Oh. So a thick bottom pan is not going to appreciably change temperature. You can do that all day long. It's going to hold its temperature. Second thing is have a pan that has a nice beveled edge. All right. Because if you have a 90 degree edge, you can't get your tool in there. It's going to burn every time right there. But mm -hmm. a nice beveled edge, you can get your tool in there. And third thing is use a roux. Look at that. Beautiful. Just went through the peanut butter roux for our Creole sauce. Now you're approaching the etouffee roux. This is our brown roux that would be used in the etouffee, which again means to smother. Mm -hmm. So you've already made the thickener and, and, and the, the flavor profile that would go to all three of our sauces. The, the blonde roux for the for the soup, the dirty blonde for our manier sauce, the peanut butter roux for our creole sauce. That's a perfect, you smell that nice, mm, yeah. nice aroma, yeah. isn't that great? It's that That is what you'd use in that etouffee. So next step is for our, our gumbo roux, okay. okay? Now, it's, as you were talking about just the way it heats and the way the, the pan heats, again, it's just reminding me what we talked about earlier, how there's so much science involved and what we're doing on the stove. That's right. And it's not just like, oh, we'll mix this up, but all that science kind of comes into this, which is cool. Yeah, it's good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Now, look at that. Too dark now for an etouffee, so we're heading on to our gumbo roux. Mm. Oh, that smells so good. Doesn't it? Making you hungry now, it huh? It is, it is. How do they manage to stand here for all that time smelling this deliciousness, I would lose my patience. <laughs> well, a lot of times we eat while we roll. You know? Okay. All right. You know, this is down here. It's uh, some people say it's fat. We, we say it's credibility. You know, <laughs> you spend all this time saying you, you, you don't ever eat from a skinny chef. That's ah, all I have to say. See, so I, I've got credibility. That's okay, right. All right. And so you don't have to resist. If something <laughs> smells good, you're snacking while you're cooking, right? So we're just about to hit that. Okay. So what we're going to do now while you're working that beautiful roux is we're going to set our gumbo pot back in place. And we're going to, I'm just going to put a little bit of heat in the bottom of this uh, dry pot right now. And we're going to, we're going to take some of our, our Trinity vegetables and, and put them in that pot. And what we can do is I can, We'll turn this off now. Okay. Your roux is going to continue to cook until you get it out of there. All right. So we're going to swap positions. I'm going to, I'm going to keep this from burning for you. You did a great job, Thank Chris. You. That's beautiful. Thank you. And what I want you to do is take a third of your Trinity vegetables, a third of the onion and the celery and here, and put them in your gumbo pot. Okay. And then we're going to turn the heat up on that. Okay. So you're going to put a third. Just grab them with your hands and put them in there. About a third. Beautiful. You can put a little more in there if you want. Okay. It's really up to you. Like you said earlier, it's an art. It's not a definitely a, a hard okay. science. And let's turn our heat up by just touching the dots down. Let's turn it up to about two thirds of the way up. Oops. Or there just you touch go. the dots That's themselves. It. There you Ooh, go. This is a fancy stove. It is. So what we're going to do, if you know, if we put some fat in there, that's sautéing. You've done that. But we want to sweat this down. Sweating means nothing else is in here except the vegetables themselves. These Trinity vegetables are aromatic vegetables. They're 90% water and sugar by weight. So by putting the heat on this, the heat's going to extract the water. The water's going to turn to steam. And if we put our lid on there, the steam would roll in that lid and extract the sugars and caramelize. But we can do this without, without uh, that, that lid and just get it in there. And let's, you'll hear them frying up. And that's pulling the water out and the sugars, okay? And your roux is beautiful. I'm just gonna keep it from burning while you're working on that next step. Thank you. So I don't have to put like butter in here or an oil or anything to keep- You don't have to. You don't have to. You could saute them. Like if you didn't have time to hang in the kitchen, you had to go do other things, you could put a little fat in there, put the lid on it and let it saute down. But if you've got the time like we do today to stand here and watch it and stir it, then you don't have to put that. You're gonna just sweat them down by using their uh, resident uh, water and sugar that's in there, okay? 
Can you smell that kind of almost like a vinegary yeah. aroma? Isn't that beautiful? It is. That's that's the sugar starting to come out of uh, that. Well, what I kind of like about this too is that you know most people think of onions being so overpowering and they make you cry, mm -hmm. but the way they're mixed with the other vegetables here, it really softens that up and it really feels it, fresh. It does, yeah. it does. How long, how long does it take to chop all this up? It takes a lot of time yeah. if you're doing it at home. If you're doing it at home. In fact, the prep work is always the hardest part of cooking, mm -hmm. you know. And so, if you've got someone, say, say, say your your buddy or your spouse doesn't like to cook so much, but they don't mind helping out, doing all the chopping in here makes it easier to cook, and then doing the cleanup later is wonderful. All right. That's the division of labor in my house. <laughs> okay. Well, that works great for me at home. Usually. Uh, I'll, I'll do the prep work one day, put it all in the refrigerator, and that way the next day when I'm ready to cook and I'm in that mood, I turn my music up and I just go right to cooking like we're doing yeah. here today. Because the prep work can take a uh, considerable time. Yeah. You get it right. That's, I think one thing too, that in, you know, in our society where we're so fast, a lot of hustle bustle, and we forget like the sort of the joy of basking in the aromas and the smells and That's the patience right. of it. Um, there's a lot of zen to this, I suppose. It's a good way to put it. You, you've hit on, on something very important. That's why, you know, I have friends that will tell you they'll take an hour and 45 minutes to make this roux. Right. You did it in maybe 20 minutes or so. And the reason is beca because of that. These aromas come out, it gets the salivary glands and the digestive juices going, it pulls that oxygen out of the blood, and you relax. And so those kind of guys, they don't want anybody else in the kitchen with them. Get out of the kitchen. You know, they just want to sit there and spend all that time thinking and, and playing with their cooking. Uh, wonderful stuff. But it, it is a, it's a wonderful way. Uh, and you don't have to be a good cook or a famous cook or anything. You just have to want to uh, play with it, mm -hmm. right? Now, what am I smelling here between the roux and this? Now I'm getting kind of a different scent profile. Yeah, because you're still getting the smoky, nutty aroma coming from here. But you're getting kind of a, you were first getting kind of a little bit of a vinegary mm -hmm. smell, acidic smell coming out of that onion. But now you're getting the sugars. You see it's starting to brown up a little bit on the bottom. Yeah. Those are the sugars. Okay. Okay. And the reason we're doing this is, is this is what we, we were speaking of earlier. It's layering. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't have a lot of ingredients to pick from. So we, we layer these three times. We're going to put these in to extract the sugars. And at this point, we now can put another third of, of the trinity in there, okay, okay, okay. beautiful, nice selection. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and let's turn our stove off just for a moment. Okay. And then spread those, spread those vegetables around. So that, that, uh, that second layer, we're, we're not going to turn the heat back on the stove until we get some stock in there, some liquid. And we want that second layer to cook down in the liquid. Now, because of the way we've cooked the first two layers, you're not gonna really recognize them as onion, celery, and green pepper, because they're gonna brown up and cook down. When you bite into them, they're gonna have a mushy texture, not really pleasing. And also when you bite into them, they're not gonna taste like onion, celery, or green pepper, because they've given their, their flavor up to the pot. Mm -hmm. But they did their job. First layer gives us the sugars. Mm -hmm. Second layer gives us a combined vegetable flavor for the stock. The last third, remember what we talked about doing with leftovers, the last third of our trinity, we're gonna add just before we serve our guests. Oh. It's not gonna have a chance to cook down. It's only gonna warm to the temperature of the pot. So now you can see it for presentation. You go, oh, that's a piece of celery there. You'll be able to bite into it and have a nice texture to it and a nice individual taste of onion, celery, green pepper. So using the same ingredients, we get three distinctly different results. That layering is what sets South Louisiana cooking aside. All right, so now what we're gonna do is spread that evenly on the bottom and you're gonna pour your roux very carefully, very slowly on, on top of your, your vegetables here. Well, based on And that's my... gonna stop the roux from cooking. Based on my performance with the flour, I'm a little worried here. <laughs> just pour, no, you're doing great. So just very, very slowly, so it doesn't splatter. And do I spin it like, or just, just dump it in one just spot? Just put it however you want, very slowly though, and then you progress, because that's hot fat and flour. In the industry, we chefs call this Cajun napalm, because it'll okay. all of us chefs down here have rue burns on our hands, wrist forms. It's just part of the game. It's hot flour. If you don't ever put anything cold directly into your roux, it'll pop back at you. 
Oh. And certainly never put liquid into that hot roux because mm -hmm. it'll have a chemical reaction cover you mm -hmm. with, with hot fat. You'll be going to the, the, the emergency room with well. severe burns. Yeah. But you got all that in there. You just set that back down. Good. Okay. You see how it's still bubbling hot in there? You just yeah. put it on room temperature vegetables and it's still bubbling hot. So let's stop the roux from cooking by stirring it into those vegetables. And that'll hold its flavor profile of that color, that aroma taste. Okay, right there. Pulling it down. Mm. And it's Chris, look, it's you, looking good already. Right. <laughs> it does look good. And you worked really, really hard to make that beautiful, perfect roux. And so we don't want to transfer there and burn it in there. So we're not going to put heat on this pot until we add our stock and we're assured that all that roux, that sticky roux, is dissolved up into that stock. Okay? okay. So here we have a chicken stock. Several ways to get a chicken stock. One way is if you're here with me at 5.30 in the morning, the lady comes by with her push carts calling chickens for sale, buy a couple hump, plump hens, put them in a pot with some tap water, put the lid on it so they don't jump out and run away and boil the heck out of them. See, <laughs> you pour off the liquid, there's your stock. The feathers, bones, all that, save it for something else. But that's a lot of work, that's a lot of work. Go to aisle nine in the grocery store, you can buy a can or a box of Weilers or Campbell's or Swanson, and boom, 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 there's, there it is. Both those methods work well. What we're using here is a base. Uh, there's several bases out there that you can get in your grocery stores, but it's a paste and you put tap water in there, you bring it to a simmer, you put that baser, makes a nice stock every time. So let's go ahead and add our stock okay. into there. No heat yet. Beautiful. Mm. Now, what you want to do with that wooden uh, root spoon is feel that bottom. Get all that root to dissolve up. And you'll be able to feel it. If you, you'll feel if it's going, you'll know there's still root stuck on the bottom. But once you're convinced that all that sticky root is dissolved up into that stock, then and only then are we going to turn that stove back on. Oh, because if we turn it on too early, it'll scald the root that's still on the bottom. That's oh, right. Yeah. That's okay. right. So these dishes, you could start the night before in a slow cooker and then add your texture to it the next day before you serve your guests. Uh, or you can start it early in the morning, let it go all day, all right? Uh, these these one-pot meals were designed uh, for back in the day when people didn't have the luxury of just cooking. Mm -hmm. They had a dozen other things to do during their day, right? Day, right? And, so, and so they wanted something they could put in there, get going, and then just let it sit there and simmer while they go about their business and then come back and serve. All right, I think I'm ready for some heat. All right, so let's put our heat up to uh, high. And now this is gonna build fairly quickly, okay? Let's have our chicken and put it in there. Again, this is parboiled chicken. At home, you can use raw chicken and cube it up, put it in there. And then let's add our andouille sausage. Beautiful. I'm gonna make sure I have every last piece of it. It's good in stuff. <laughs> and let's add our pope, our garlic. So we have fresh chopped garlic there. Okay. We take whole cloves of garlic, go ahead and add the it. Whole thing? We, yep. And we, uh, we put that in a food processor and grind it down really fine. So it's gonna cook down. You're not gonna see it for presentation. You're not gonna get individual texture, but it's gonna flavor the sauce. So we're gonna layer that garlic as well. On the far right there, you see there's some dried garlic. Mm -hmm. Let's take that, spin that lid off, and Chris, what I want you to do is just dust the top of that with, with that. You know, garlic's one of those miracle foods. Every study comes out, it tells you more wonderful things that it does for you. You're doing good. Keep on going. Okay. All right. Doing good. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. All right. So, yeah, it's good for your heart, your cardiovascular, wonderful stuff. And now we're going we're gonna to add some spice to this. Uh, in the cooking industry, when you put two or more spices together, we call it a spice kit. <clears throat> the reason to have a spice kit is to make it easier on you to cook. And so you can replicate that particular dish or that culture's flavor, that region's flavor very easily. And, and a spice kit, first of all, has most of the spices and herbs in it that, that you need. So you don't have to, for instance, in our, our Joe stuff, it has 18 different spices and herbs. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to stock 18 different things. More importantly, they're in there in the correct ratio to one another. So if, you, if you've cooked a lot uh, and you've had this happen to you if, you, if you do cook a lot, and that is 
your, your cousin Ernie's over, he comes early for the party, he's there to help, but he's distracting you. And you're, you look at the recipe and say, okay, I need a, a tablespoon of salt. And you measure, you put it in there. And then you go back and go, oh, no, 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 no. It was just a quarter teaspoon of salt. It's a, it's a tablespoon of paprika. Salt was the next line down. A spice kit keeps you from doing that because not only are all the spice and herbs in there, but they're in the right ratio. So you don't have to, don't have to do a lot of measuring. And spice kits in North America are typically 15 to 18% salt. Our Joe stuff is only one seventh that. It's only two and a half percent because the designer of this, Chef Paul Prudhomme, wasn't in a big salt kick at a time. And spice kits are, in North America are generally designed to just dust the top of the dish. Think of uh, something like um, the, uh, uh, a steak seasoning. You're not gonna put a little pinch on there. You're gonna dust the top of that piece of meat, use your fingers, press it and flip it and do the same thing. So you're gonna do that here as well. You're gonna spin the lid off of, that, uh, off of that one right there, okay? And just dust, give a good dusting to the top of that. Now I've been stirring here as my natural instinct mm -hmm. has suggested. I may have been doing it all wrong though. I mean, should this have just been sitting here or should I have been? No, stirring? no, no, you can stir as much okay. as you want. That's good. There we go. That's a good amount to start, okay? All right, so we'll stir that up. Get it going. And with that, my friend, your gumbo is complete except for time cooking. Again, usually we're gonna cook these six, eight hours, sometimes overnight, okay? So we can put a lid on it and let it simmer away and go to our dessert. Very good. How's that? All right. Let me get a lid for you. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> You're done good. <laughs> Thank you for your help. So every good meal has to have dessert. You're going to give yes. us a New Orleans favorite? Absolutely. Bananas Foster. It is the most popular flambe dessert throughout the world now. And uh, it was created just around the corner at Brennan's Restaurant, literally a block and a half from here. Flambe, that implies fire. Fire <laughs> and sparkles and flames. Absolutely. So Chris, what you're going to do is melt down this butter on a, on a medium heat. Okay. So it's on this one right here. And then once it's melted down, you're going to cream in some brown sugar. Does four count for medium on this? Yeah, that'll be okay. Good. Very good. Melt down okay. brown sugar, spoon, whisk. Yeah, what, a spoon. And then just stir it around? You're going to melt it down. You don't have to stir it a whole lot. You just want it to get melted down. Okay. Okay. And then once that's melted, you're going to cream in the brown sugar. Okay. And then from there, uh, we're going to add some bananas and some banana liqueur to add flavor. And then we'll flambe it with some, with some rum. Okay. Now, Bananas Foster starts uh, in the 1950s uh, when Owen Brennan, the, the, the patriarch of the Brennan's family, uh, challenged his chefs to make use of all these bananas that were over litter on the dock. 85% uh, of the fruit coming into North America was coming through the port of New Orleans from places such as Honduras and Ecuador and El Salvador and offloaded here. And when bananas would fall off the pallets or out of those cargo nets, they would just leave them. They weren't gonna waste their back muscles in the middle of a 12 hour work day. So they'd just leave them, it gets too messy, they'd push them off in the river and down the river that fruit would go. So Owen always thought that was a terrible waste of otherwise good fruit. He recalls his sister uh, relating a story that when, when they were young, she remembered when strangers or different people would show up at her door unannounced, she wanted to do something nice for them. So she would always take some butter and some brown sugar and cream it down. Remember, we grow more sugar here than any place else in North America, always have. And so that was never a shortage of that. So she would take butter, twice as much brown sugar, cream it down, and then put something with it, some berries, whatever else she had. Well, today's Bananas Foster doesn't go too far from that original uh, recipe. So it's it's an amount of butter, twice as much brown sugar, cream it in, and then add your bananas. Uh, you can use green tip bananas, which are green on the tips, uh, yellow in the middle, about 24 hours away from being fully ripe. Or you can use uh, overripe bananas, which will have wonderful uh, uh, taste to them, but they won't be very good for presentation they'll, or texture. They'll be all mushy. Yeah. You could use plantains, sweet plantains, boil them up to soften them and use those or no bananas at all. You could take some nice yellow clean peaches and put them in, just don't call it Bananas Foster and use maybe a peach schnapps instead of a banana liqueur or some nice tart apples like a Granny Smith. 
So let's take our brown sugar and put that in, put it all in there and let's get it creamed in. I better get some bananas ready here, huh? Doing good, so we're just gonna cream that in. Any secret to the stir to make it creamy? No, you just, the longer it sits in that heat, the creamier it's going to become, okay? okay. And this is basically just melting the sugar granules and then combining it with the butter? That's it, that's it. Mm. Anything with this much sugar and this much butter has to be healthy for us. It is healthy, it's gonna be delish. It's gonna be wonderful. Looks wonderful. Now, I'm using a spoon here as opposed to the flat whisk, for instance. Why is the spoon okay for this as opposed to the whisk, which was perfect? Well, because the temperature we're using, which is usually not too, too high of a temperature, uh, is gonna allow the, the, um, the, the brown sugar to cream into that butter really nice, okay? okay. It doesn't have to be crazy stirred and blended with a whisk, it just needs to be creamed out, okay? Now for those there who don't go, know, chef. thank you. For those who don't know, including me, um, the term creamed, what does that mean? That's ex better, pictures were a thousand words, right. just like that. See how creamy and smooth that is? Yeah. Okay. So as you mentioned, all those grains, all that granulated sugar has now uh, dissolved and creamed into that butter. So now we can throw some bananas in. All right, just dump them in. You can put half of them in now and they're gonna, that first half will cook down in there and get soft and, and flavor that. And the, and the other half we can add after we flambe it. Ooh. Okay. Man okay. like fire. There we go. And let's, uh, we're gonna, what we're gonna do is turn our heat on high here. Okay. So, Chris, you're gonna add a splash of that banana liqueur to help push the flavor of those bananas. Good, stir it up. And, then, oh. and then set that down, and if you would, pick up the voodoo dust, which is our cinnamon. Now, cinnamon's highly flammable, so don't make your pajamas out of cinnamon. That's my one hit. And what I'm gonna flambe this by pouring some rum around the edge. That hot edge of the pan is gonna vaporize the rum. We're gonna see a cloud. We don't wanna stand in the cloud because that's what's gonna light. Okay. And I'm gonna light the cloud, it's gonna travel down. And then you're gonna take the voodoo dust and pinch it with your fingers and throw it into the flame. Okay. Right in the middle, not here, not up here, you'll get burnt, but throw it right in the middle and it'll flame. Right bait. into okay? there, okay. All right, are All we right. ready? Um, I think I'm ready. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, throw it in there. More voodoo dust. <laughs> Fun, huh? Woo! Now, does any cinnamon actually get in there? Uh, yeah, the stuff is flambeing is going up, but yeah, you can throw it, throw it a little lower if you want. Looks like the flame is a little bit of flame there. A little bit more. Now, usually we'll do this with all the lights out, and you can really see yeah. that effect. But wow, that's fun. That's okay. Fun. So let's turn our heat off and let's move the pan off the heat. Otherwise, it's gonna caramelize in there. And then Chris, let's stir in the rest of your bananas. That room temperature fruit's gonna help take some of the heat out of that pan and help keep that from caramelizing. Stir it in. And that, my friends, bananas foster. That's gonna Ooh. get poured over some ice cream. <laughs> That's the fanciest dessert I have ever made. Isn't that fun? Can it we... used to be uh, that uh, Cherry's Jubilee was the most popular flambe dessert around the world till about 25 years ago, and then our own New Orleans Bananas Foster overtook that. So the most asked for flambe dessert throughout the world is this, what you just made. Mm, it came with fire and sparkles. There you go. So, Tom, thank you so much for an exceptional lunch. I can't wait to go and eat our delicious creations. You're welcome, Chris. You did a great job. Thank let's you so taste much. it. All right, let's go. Oh, I can't wait. It was so good to smell this. Looking at it, it's beautiful. Now let's see how it holds up to the taste test. Mmm. Tom is a good instructor. This is perfect. I feel like I'm 
eating New Orleans in a bowl here, and all those layers of culture and history that he talked about, all right here in front of me, and those four aspects of flavor that Tom talked about are really at play, making this just a delightful, delightful bowl of gumbo. And I love gumbo. This is the best I've ever had. Where I come from, we eat dessert first. I've got to jump to that bananas foster. Mmm. The warm bananas, cold ice cream. This is a fantastic dish that's doing a lot for me on a lot of different levels, but most importantly, it's delicious. Hats off to the chef, and hats off, most importantly, to Tom.